Oh my god. Call. See, nothing's changed on the IT side of things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. mine has cam. Let's go. We got high levels of technology. You play the roulette of which computer has cam and which has yeah. inventor. Every and single yeah. time. Mm-hmm. And that one does not Wait, hold on. If I open a file, does this change anything? Where, where is everyone else? Well, Thankfully not here. Didn't show up. Hey, maybe we've come to this event. Oh my god. I'm not even joking. Or Eli. 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 My college friend and a good enough at this, but they were like, Burgers you can teach in our trade school so program. Oh my god. So I teach machine shop yeah, one for our, like, for our, like, trade school in Bozeman, basically our equivalent of Renton Tech. I don't go to Burger King after this. I don't have breakfast, lunch. I really like it. It's, Bozeman is a great town, rents a little high, but still cheaper than here. Did you go to Burger King? Yeah, we're back to five. Utterly beautiful. Yeah. It's a story. I don't care, I get two sandwiches for seven dollars. Oh, First meal today, breakfast, regardless of breaking. What are you majoring in? Mechanical engineering. Yeah, I guess it's some parts yeah. of the world it's I mean, lunch time right now. I've really liked it. Yeah, the cost wise, it's very comparable to most everywhere else. The three colleges that I narrowed down where I wanted to go to was Eastern, uh, WSU, or Montana State. And nice. I mean all of them are reasonably priced. One of the nice things about MSU, we have a great shop, and like I started TA in our machine shop when I was a freshman, so I've had shop access my whole time. I get to do whatever programming I want. I can literally walk into the shop. They gave me keys my sophomore year, so I can go in whenever I want and do whatever parts I desire. And if you guys are looking at the mechanical engineering side of things, Mechanical engineering technology is that it's a more applied, hands-on type program. And I think for a lot of the guys in FAB that I know, if you're looking to do the engineering route, I think it's a really great way because you take some more of the shop stuff, you get to do more of the stuff hands-on, you're not stuck behind a desk doing calculations and stress analysis for 40 hours a week. Yeah. So, yeah, but we can kind of chat on once everybody's... Once we kind of get through stuff today, I'd, I'd be happy to answer any questions you guys have about schools. If you're looking to trade school, I'm happy to talk about that. And I, with teaching that in the last year, I understand a good deal of how all that works. A bunch of my young engineers actually came out of Montana State, so that's... One? That's just... Where'd you go yeah. tonight? Yeah, until I retired. Yeah. <laughs> Starting pay difference at Boeing between UW and MSU. MSU is a much cheaper degree. It was five hundred dollars a year in twenty nineteen. Yep. So. Yeah. There's not. Six. I've been looking at uh, MSU as one of my schools. So. Yeah. If you want to come out and visit, let me know, and I'll give you the personal tour around all the shop stuff. Nice. Uh, we've got a VF four with a five axis trunnion on it. Couple, a lot of mini mills, a lot of two axis CNCs that are really great for prototype work. A lot of miscellaneous stuff. Nice. Yeah. Resident Mikhail reference. reference. Yeah. Engineer at Boeing. Uh, yeah, I was a metal electrical engineer. Good work. Okay. Good work. Uh, <coughs> good school too. Yeah. yeah. That was one of the five I visited. So, yeah. LSU and. You were by over the two that just didn't quite, weren't quite the right fit for me. Tanner, what? Oh, yeah. That's where I was at at MSU. I mean, with Louie, <laughs> my tuition's <laughs> as cheap as I would be at State Fair. Yeah, you can. Yeah. They're not normal like that. The text voice always always say something. Recording a tape with that, bro? Yeah. And are we just waiting on the one computer? Yeah. I got cam on the phone, so we should be good. Perfect. I'm Dude, the cam for this is crazy. crazy. What? Ow. The longest part of it I machined in this shop was 
21 hours. The longest cam I've ever done technically, or the most complex tool path I ever did was about two hours for a carbon fiber mold. Doing, I was, at some points I was using a quarter inch end mill sticking out four inches below a holder. It's a chatter nightmare, but we got the part done <laughs> until a grad student took it out right before the last finishing pass and wrecked it. Uh -huh. And wrecked 20 hours of cam and two hours of machine time. But I would be going to Hans. Already throwing it. Let the grad student run it. It'll be fine, they said. Takeaways, I can share. Takeaway, Henry. Take away Take away Henry. It's life in the next You know, you have to start about that when you watch the cooling running, and it's all white and sunny. You see, that just became red. That's kind of where my mind goes. Alright, well, let's get this party started then. Let's go. Do this stuff. My name is Matthew Colt. It sounds like you guys have heard a little bit of my background, but short of it, I was on bare metal 2017 to 2019. Fab the whole time. Led Fab for a bit. Also led Pit Crew for a bit. So if you look around and there was something from that time frame, I probably either machined it or at least helped work on it. Whether it's outreach bots, all the comm bots, prototype bot. The giant metal plate on the VF3 was my idea. So basically, what I did, grew up here, went through bare metal after that, and turned an exotic metals forming company. They're an aerospace sheet metal supplier down in Kent. They do the craziest, hardest sheet metal components on the planet. You can tell from this face, you know who they are and what they do. So, welding 20,000 thick titanium. Hydroforming stuff. They have presses that you, they built the building around the press. So they go, they install the press, they build the building around it because it's so big. <clears throat> Interned there, worked in manual weld, doing the craziest TIG welding you've ever seen. X-ray quality, all the, all the fun stuff. After that, went off to college. I've been at MSU for three and a half years, getting my degree in mechanical engineering, and then since I've been at MSU, I teach in our machine shop part-time, so I work with capstone students, so I got to be the fun freshman who was telling the seniors what to do, which was really fun. Fun fact, a lot of engineers don't understand how to make anything. You guys understanding how to make stuff makes you very valuable, is when you design something, it can actually be made. That's the hardest thing for an engineer, for an engineer to understand is how things are made, because they're trained to how do you design something, but not how do you design something for manufacturing. So, outside of my TA job, I, over the summer, was developing a new form of carbon fiber for the Army through the Composites Research Group at MSU. So, developing a brand new kind of carbon fiber called Stretch Broken. Basically, fibers are held in a glue matrix. We can pre-break the fibers by stretching them, breaking them at their weak points. The glue still holds everything together, the fibers give it strength like rebar and concrete. So what I was doing for them was developing a resin filming process. So we were regularly creating film resins, so basically think thin layers of glue down as thin as half a thou. And I designed and made the filming head that we were making all this on and machined it myself. So that's where I've used a lot of my machining was I was doing a lot of the mold work for them and developing the carbon fiber resin filming process. Because you got to combine the fibers with the glue, it's an epoxy resin, and so we need the right amount of glue, the right amount of fiber. Then, this last year, I also started teaching in our trade school. So, think our version of Renton Tech, basically. So, I taught Machine Shop 1, mostly manual machining, my students have open lab hours, so I also supervise the CNC work as well. But since going to college, I've also become quite familiar with all the manual machining processes. So my bread and butter is vertical milling. The VF3 in there is my baby. That thing is great. It's great. But yeah, that's a quick background about me. Um, yeah, so. We're going to start by walking through some fixture design. So why is this important? Something I want to ask you guys, how do you guys think I made this part? 
How would you guys go about making this part? What, what are some people's ideas? Weight, man. Just like machine it on a piece of weight. Okay. How do you do the second side? <laughs> uh, someone has to part over the summer, I think it was. You take a little block and you cut out the top side. Uh, if you leave that little chunk or little edge uh, spine, then you turn around, clamp it on the, uh, with the bottom side that's now like, smaller, and then just do a machine up on top. Okay. Yeah, that would work. How are you going to locate this? Oh, because it's a circle now, yeah. Mm-hmm. You saw your dots? Yep. Soft That was my solution. Op 1, I do it just in a normal DX6 curved vise. I machine it down 20 thou lower than this bottom surface, flip it, cut some soft jaws, toss it in, it locates it, and it makes these parts. These locate within about 1 to 3 thou accuracy to the table using dowel pins. So I'm getting great accuracy, super easy to set up. I literally leave guys who had never ran a mill before to swap parts and run them super easily. But soft jaws were the key part there. This part was designed specifically so that I have flats, so that way I can run on my soft jaws. But even if I didn't, I could locate off of some of the holes. So fixture design is important because when you get to the more complex world of parts, you gotta figure out how to hold everything. You guys deal with a lot of tube, angle iron, but if it's anything like when I was here, you don't do that many super crazy complex parts that are really weird to hold. When you get out into industry, you see some crazy stuff. A lot of it you can't just do in one op. You gotta be holding it in multiple axes. You're having to put dovetails into things to hold them. You're maybe running fourth or fifth axis parts. So fixture design becomes increasingly important as your complexity increases. And there are some parts where you gotta do weird stuff. Let's see if I can find the part on the robot over here that I kind of wanted to talk about. So something I kind of want to draw people's attention to this here. Example where I use this one see. You look at these yellow brackets here, these have an angle space with tap holes. How do we go about creating all that geometry? Because it's really funky. You're trying to create holes perpendicular to a face that's a pain to reach. So those are instances where we use some of the crazier stuff to actually do FRC parts. Parts that are kind of weird. In this case, I machine the top surface, then I actually flip this, set the angled face on some jaws, use a one, two, three block to space me out an inch and locate. And then what that lets me do is I can drill from the back side to create those holes. So I don't need any special fixturing, but I'm just thinking about how am I holding my part and where are my operations ordered so that way I can create the geometry I'm trying to do. So that's kind of the why you should care. And then what we're going to talk about is importance, methodology, common designs. We're going to talk about fixture plates for a little bit. We're going to talk about soft jaws for a little bit. And we're going to go through some examples of how do I actually use this. So that's kind of the overall plan. And then after this, We'll kind of do some Q&A, talk about things for a bit, and then we'll slide on to 3D tool pathing. This one, if you got, I didn't think that I would have time to have you guys design a whole fixture. That's generally a pretty intensive process. But if you guys are interested or have some stuff you want and ideas you want to run by me, feel free. If you guys ever want to contact me, I'm there on the Discord, and Maggie, Collins have my info. So. If you guys ever run into some weird challenge you can't figure out, feel free to reach out. But why use fixtures? As previously said, vices have limitations. They get, they're great if you have square, rectangular parts. They get really annoying when you have anything that isn't those. So complex curves, hard to grip on a vise. Fixtures can be flipped also to get multiple access sides. So, have you guys, any of you guys ever flipped a vise on its side to hold something because you needed to the access for it? Probably not, but I've done it once or twice because that's how we needed to hold stuff. This is an example part. 
So this is for a finger engine, which is one of our demo parts. We need to inspect them. So we use a coordinate measuring machine, measures down to about two, three micron. So that's about a tenth of a thou resolution. So we need to be able to hold that sideways so we can come in and probe it. So that way we can measure it. So we did, I designed this little fixture here, it's spring loaded. There's some pins embedded into here. You put the part on, the springs clamp down and hold it. It's completely toolless. You can swap them in and out in under five seconds. Weird part to hold, weird orientation to hold it in, but super easy way to fix it. Another example, this is a flywheel for the same, same engine assembly. So we're actually, I'm using a little V-block, again, just spring-loaded, holds the part, locates it close enough. The machine will orient itself to the part as long as your part's located within about 5,000. So 3D printing can even be a great way to do this. If you only need one or two uses, it's great. You guys have probably seen this. <laughs> yeah. You guys done some yeah. big plates like that? Yeah. Now, how many screw heads have you hit? <laughs> Don't worry, I hit a lot of them. But fixture plates are great. They let you run a lot of parts at once. Yeah, and this is how we did it for bare metal. It's great for our plate workflow, you guys know that. But you can also do a lot of stuff with using, putting pins into those threaded holes. You can use dowel pins. There's a lot of plate stuff that's very helpful, especially when you get into running a lot of parts. So let's talk, how do you actually get through designing a fixture? How do you, how do you think about it? What are, you, what are the first things you gotta ask? First thing I'm gonna always ask, is tolerancy. So, how often do you guys actually measure every dimension on the part that you're creating? It's like when I was here, you never do. It's probably good enough. But, what are, what are some instances of where you guys care a lot about tolerancy? Bearing holes. Bearing holes. What else? Spacers. Spacers. No. Anything else? Gearbox stuff? Whole locations on those. We've had one or two that came out a little wonky and the gears don't work, <laughs> stuff like that. But the first thing you gotta ask yourself is what level of tolerance am I needing? If it's a bearing hole, we're talking ten thousandths. You really need to be in that plus or minus about a half thou range according to the manufacturer. In reality, you guys have about a plus or minus one thou, as you guys have probably seen. You can be slightly sloppy and it'll still work. But you gotta ask yourself, how much accuracy do I need? Because that's gonna determine how good does your fixture need to be. In this case, this is another CMM fixture. So CMM is just basically a machine that probes, uses a probe, kind of like the Haas's, to measure your parts precisely. Again, I only need to locate about plus or minus 5,000. I'm just using a couple screw, socket head screws with a little string-loaded clamp, 3D printed, that gets me about plus or minus 3,000 accuracy. That's good enough for my application. But it wouldn't be good enough if I was machining the part. So the first thing you want to ask is how tight does it need to be? And that's going to be dictated entirely by a part drawing once you guys get out of high school. How many of you guys have actually seen like a part drawing? Okay. So the part drawing is going to tell you all of the information about tolerance. But let's, let's move back towards what we're doing here. Analyze, does the location matter? And does the feature dimension matter? So basically think, where is the thing? How big is the thing? Answer those two questions and determine how much do I care? If you're putting a piece of plate onto the mill, how much do you care about locating that edge? You really don't, as long as you're within like a sixteenth of zeroing or five. You don't need to probe a piece of plate every time. So that's where your plate fixtures that you guys use, they're not as exact as a vice. You're not zeroing them with a probe every time. You don't have to do that. So that's a great example. The other thing you want to think about is datums. Datums are a critical feature on a part. So, for example, 
Where, what, what features do you guys think would be a good datum on this part? Okay, so I'll go into a little more detail about a datum. A datum is going to be a reference surface. So if I'm going and I'm specking out how, what's the tolerance on this hole? Where can it be? How big is it? I'm going to start probably by referencing three flat edges. So I would probably start datum here, datum here, datum here. Beyond that, the next thing that I'm going to do is that's going, that I'm going to use those datums to locate the first hole. Because this hole, we care quite a bit about where it's at. But what we more so care about, if let's say this is a gearbox, I'm going to care about the distance from this hole to this hole. So I'll probably make this hole a datum, and then I'll use that to measure my other bearing holes. That's a great example for a gearbox. The holes on a gearbox, you're going to have one that'll be a datum, everything else will be referenced to that. So whenever you're designing a fixture, you want to touch the datums. So let's look at some of the swerve modules. How, how does Patrick do the datum? Patrick's datums are going to be probably where your input shafts are coming from the motors are going to be two of your datums. He's then going to care a lot about where these other holes are. So if he has to do these in multiple operations, he doesn't. I, I actually know him personally, or like friend of a friend type deal. But he's going to care a lot about those locations. So. If I had to flip this plate over and do some countersinks or something on the other side, I want to hold that, or at least locate it, by the datums. So if I had to flip this part, how many times have you, you can literally see it on these, how these bearing holes are out of, out of alignment, like pass that around? Well, that was a design feature. Yeah, it might be a design feature, but also, how many of you guys have flipped a tube and not gotten the bearing holes located properly? Yeah, it's, it's a thing that happens. So you want to locate to the critical features or the datums. We do that because those are what matter. Do you care where one random hole on the top of that part is a ton? Not really. Do you care where the bearing hole is and how big it is? Yes. So when you're flipping parts multiple times, doing multiple operations, the second thing you want to think about is, where are my datums, and where do I need to measure from? Because that's going to be very critical. And the datums are going to give you your locating features. So when you guys flip tube stock, you're using the back left corner, and you keep that consistent the whole time. That gets you within a couple thousandths, right? But if you need really, really tight accuracy, measure to the bearing hole. So that's how, when I look at this part, these are offset for a design purpose, so there's a reason for it. But how, you guys know how you generally machine the bearing holes in the same operation? You do both going all the way through? Yeah, when you can, you want to do it. That's because if you flip it and try to relocate it, you're going to be off a little bit. There's always that, that level of tolerance. So, Kind of what you're going to start with is how accurate do I need it to be? Step two is where do I need to locate it from? Datums and locating features. Identify where, where do I, where is critical on the part? Identify how do I keep referencing those whenever I flip the part, do stuff like that. If I have to flip this sideways, I use a pin to find where this hole is. I can't use a probe and come in and find it, but I can put a pin out here and use that to locate. Stuff like that. That's how you want to start by thinking, is if you can identify that, you, then you can identify how do I need to hold. So, tolerancing. This is where you kind of need to think about things a little more in depth. So, what size difference is needed? Think bearings. 
Do you guys make your bearings to be a press fit, a slip fit? Do you want it to jostle around a little bit like a bolt? Think about your fitment. That's going to tell you your tolerance. So, example. On this part, there is a bunch of tiny little holes on the back here. Those fit precision ground pins. I need those accurate to within a half a thousandth of an inch because those are what locate this part to the machine it's running. Those pins are meant to be just slightly a slip fit. So they're allowed to have a ten thousandth of an inch up to about eight ten thousandths of an inch on it because they just barely slip over. We need them to slip, but we don't need them to have a bunch of slop because they're located in the part. On the screws, you guys have seen a drill tap chart. You know how those work. You know how there's a close fit and a clearance fit. How do you pick those? You pick them because if you have to hand drill something at a comp, you probably want to go for the clearance, not the close fit, because are you going to get a hand drill to get all the accuracy? In that case, your process is going to define what the tolerance needs to be. So identify what size difference is needed. Are you locating? Do you need it really tight or bolts or something that really doesn't need it? Are you having a spacer that really needs to be within a couple thousands? Otherwise, your gearbox isn't going to fit together. Clearance is really what defines your tolerance in a lot of instances. And the other thing to remember, your parts and everything aren't going to be the exact size the design says they are. Is 2 by one 2 exactly 2 by one No. So you also have to think about that when you're fixturing. Because if you build a clamp that only works for exactly 2 inch stock, and then you try to take a piece of tube in, it's not going to work. If you try to use that for a piece that's been powder coated, it's not going to work. So keep that in mind as well. And use that to help you define what tolerance you need. For most of what you guys do, you really need about plus or minus 5 thou. That's really good for everything except the bearing holes. Because if your drill hole is off a couple thou, it's not going to matter. The screw's still going to fit in. But there are instances where you need more of the higher precision. And that's what's going to help define your tolerance. And this is one of those engineering drawings I was kind of telling you about. This defines all of the geometry of the part. How many decimal places are on here defines how accurate this needs to be. In this case, the drawing block isn't filled in, but I could come down here and see two decimal places. Generally, I'm going to have, for most of what we do at MSU, plus or minus 10 thousandths. Three decimal places, plus or minus five thou. Four decimal places, we tend to be plus or minus a half thou, or plus or minus a thou. Various part to part. The other thing you'll see is there are these weird symbols. Those are indicating specific things. In this case, this means flatness. This means cylindricity. So flatness, how flat a part is, cylindricity. If you take a perfect cylinder, compare that to what your part actually is. Because if you think about it, a round hole has a lot of things that could be wrong with it. It could be not round, it could be not square to your part, a lot of different things. And all of those are in reference to datums. In this case, this surface needs to be parallel to the bottom, stuff like that. So an engineering drawing is really nice because it'll tell you the tolerance. But you don't always have an engineering drawing. If you had to make a drawing for every part during build season, that would suck. Because <laughs> who wants to do this? You care about getting a part out. Not the tolerance in most cases. So in datums. This is that weird concept I was talking to you about. The datums are going to be where everything's referenced to. So you can see that we have the A datum here. That's being used to define how parallel this needs to be. The other places where I'd put datums on this part is I would probably put one along this bottom edge, and I would do that 
there, and then I would put one over here. So A, B, C. And you can see I've kind of built a lot of that into my part already. All of my holes are dimensioned off one edge, and all of them on the height are defined by this edge, or they're defined hole to hole. So if you get a drawing, look at where everything's based off of. If you don't get a drawing, think about what things matter. In some cases, it might make more sense to start out and have your datum be a hole that you create. So for example, this is locating two parts on top of it. So we really care about where these holes are in relation to one another. I don't really care where this top one starts exactly, but I care where everything is in relation to the hole. So analyze that, figure out where, where should you do that, and use that to zero your part. Have you guys ever had to remachine a gearbox plate or something? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and where do you guys generally zero on? In the corners of the fixture plate. It's fair. I mean, are you talking like if a hole is out of dimension or something? Yeah, something like that. Um, generally, we'll do like off a bearing hole. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Do it off of a bearing hole. If I got to remachine the size of a bearing hole because it came out half without small, and I already took it off the plate, measure it off of a bearing hole because that's going to be the most accurate thing. Can you always get to the feature to measure it or zero off of it? No. But when you can, measure to the thing that is most important. If you got to resize a bearing hole, locate off of the existing bearing hole. Stuff like that. Because every time that you put an extra layer between something, you lose accuracy. The more steps there are between the thing that you're trying to touch and measure and how you're measuring it, the worse it gets. So minimize how many steps there are in that process. If I need to remachine this bearing hole, don't locate off of here, locate off of the hole. Stuff like that. It's a practical example. Then locating fixed features, this is really tied into datums. It really just means where should I be touching my fixture? Should I be touching on a flat plate? What if that plate's not flat? Has anybody actually measured how flat the uh, fixture plate in there is on the VF3? Anybody know off the top of their head? No, we haven't run an indicator on it. Yeah. The last time I ran it recently. So. Yeah. The last time I machined it, we had about three thou variation. So if I needed something ultra flat, I would probably indicate it in and use some chips because that thing isn't perfectly flat. So sometimes you got to think about that. What surfaces do I need, need my part to be touching? Where does the part need to be located in the X, Y, and Z? And the other thing you want to reduce is how many surfaces contact something because that means that you rely on the tolerance of every surface. Versus just your datums. So if I'm trying to support a piece of square stock, the perfect engineering way to do this is I have three infinitesimally small points like this. Because three points make a plane. This is going to be perfectly flat in regards to the plane with the top of those three. If I set it on a table, we're now relying on how flat the table or this piece of cardboard is. And what if that's not flat? What if this isn't square to my machine? Think of vice. Is your vice perfectly square? No, it's not. Curved DX6, like you guys have a lot of. Those are only accurate down to about a thou perpendicularity in most cases. So. You want to minimize how much of a surface is touching because that's going to transfer the lack of flatness to whatever you're doing. Points are great. There's a thing called the 3 2 1 principle of fixturing. It's 
So if you're going to super high accuracy, think things like this. We did this a lot when I was making aerospace parts. This is going to be my block. This is going to be me looking at that block from the side. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have three indicators on my largest face. So my largest face in this instance is actually going to be on the bottom. So on the bottom, I'm going to have three contact points. My next longest edge, I'm going to have two contact points. And my last one, I'm going to have one. The reason I do that is these three points allow me to make a plane. These two then give me an edge that's perpendicular, and this locates me in the last direction. If I was doing this in industry, these would be the tops of little pins. These would be little pins, and that would be a pin. Because that's giving me the least contact area. So I'm not a, so how round these pins are isn't going to matter that much. Because they're only making contact on basically a tiny line. These are going to be small little top button type shapes. Because they're going to be making the least contact possible. Because then the tolerance on these matters less and less. So that's why you want to minimize how much of your surface is touching. If you guys are trying to square stock and you're trying to get really, really square, aluminum stock comes pretty square, right? I mean, it's a couple of out, right? If you need it square, I actually will put a little piece of welding wire in between my movable jaw and my part because it reduces my contact area. It reduces how much force I can apply to the part but it means I'm not relying on how square that part is in order, on how square that jaw is in order to keep my part square. I'm just relying on the back jaw. Stuff like that. Okay. That's the basics of tolerancing, locating, datums. Anybody got any questions with regards to that? And if you guys have questions at all throughout this, just raise a hand. But anybody have any questions on that stuff? What exactly is a pin? Um, let's see if we can have something that looks like this. Yeah. Um, or just being a piece. We used to keep some dial in this ground. I'm not sure. On the side, there's like a chart. Yeah. I helped build these originally. <laughs> straight-up cylinder. In this case, most of what we're going to be using are dowel pins. So they're really precisely ground cylindrical pins. They're held to generally tolerances of about two ten thousandths of an inch. They're really precise, really perpendicular. They're great. But they're just really precise cylinders. Generally what you'll do, for example, on this part, I use them for locating, so I put little pins in here. They press fit into the machine, so they stay there and they, they, you can't pull them out. And then you can just shove this on top. Okay. They're really common for locating. Um, I don't have any on hand here. Yeah. But does that kind of make sense? Yeah. yeah. Uh, on the, the top surface, how would you fix the pins in place? Uh, to your part, you still have a machine like tooled in there. Um, so are you asking like on these? Like on the, on the top pins, because you said you want two points of contact on the top. Mm -hmm. How do you fix those two pins in place while still giving it room to machine? So, the disadvantage of this, if, uh, so, let's say I just needed to access the top. This is a side view, so imagine that we're kind of seeing through the part. This would be kind of how the pins would look. So I'd still have some machine access. The downside of perfect fixturing like this is you lose access. Yeah. So it is a trade-off. You're going to increase your number of ops for increased locational accuracy on your fixture, generally. So 
it's kind of one of those trade-off things. What I would generally do is if I needed access to the top of this, I would shrink down how tall those pins are. Mm -hmm. That's generally what I do when I've needed to do it. But it's the same thing that you run into with a vise. The vise, your vise jaw is still going to be clamping at least like that. Because generally, unless you make custom parallels, you can only get down to about an eighth inch resolution of heights. So, uh, same issue that you run into with the vise. Chugging along. So, common designs. There are two things that I see a lot. First thing are fixture plates. They're just a plate with precisely machined holes. These are some of those dowel pins I was talking about. You can see they're literally just a cylinder, ground on the outside. You guys can walk over to the Do It Center right now and they'll have a bunch in stock. But all a fixture plate does is it's just going to have a lot of holes on a constant spacing that lets you build them up for different things. These are modular, so they have tons, and you can put all sorts of different stuff in. You can also make custom ones. When I was at Exotic, we had a custom plate that's about the size of those tool carts, the yellow ones over there, for every single duct that we were welding together. There's a giant aluminum plate that was super flat, that had all of the stuff built up so that way we could locate our ducts together, we could measure them, we could tack them together for welding. But you can also have the modular ones that have tons of holes. You can also have ones that only have the exact holes you need for one part. Just depends. But all a fixture plate does is just gives you a good base. That top surface is going to be super flat. We grind ours so Generally ours are flat within about half a thou over the entire plate. That's how we like to do ours. So what we need. They also have generally some threaded holes so I can put clamps on there. If you guys have ever heard of Mighty Bite, they make tons of clamps for this exact type of stuff. But fixture plates are great. You'll see a lot of them. You guys use them. Isn't that plate handy? It makes it super easy to hold everything down. Yeah. At Thank least, you. yeah. <laughs> The other thing you'll see a lot of are soft jaws. I'm sorry that this projector also just doesn't get great resolution because this is hard to see. But this is a pretty complex turned part. All a soft jaw does is basically you take your part, you machine out the part from a set of jaws. I don't think you... I didn't feel like trying to dig through. You guys have some pairs of soft jaws? Yeah, we do. So we could... I mean, you guys have seen these. Oh, stone. Oh, stone. But, oh, stone. Uh, but something that's kind of cool about soft draws, you can actually 3D print them. That's what those ones there are. So those are actually a carbon fiber reinforced nylon. The lights down. Didn't the lights. And we use that set of soft draws to make, oh, let's see, I think Bob got 200 parts out of them. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah. So you can actually get great results with 3D printed soft draws, especially resin printing. You get the accuracy, because most resin printers have an accuracy of around half a thou. Not necessarily the people, but it's, it's always pretty good. So, 3D printing soft jaws, especially for low run parts like what you guys do, if you got some really wonky stuff, just 3D print your jaws. Because they're great. Like you guys can see these here. You just machine the negative of whatever your profile is. It's like making a mold. You guys have ever cast something, make a mold of it. Soft draws are our equivalent of that. Something you want to think about when you're doing soft draws, though. Have, have any of you guys ever designed a pair? So, if I just design my part to be clamped, when, so let's say I'm in bang. I put two soft, the models of two soft jaws together, I put my part in, I do an extrude to remove my part. I leave this like this. Is it going to clamp? No. No, exactly. A key thing to remember with soft jaws is design how far apart you want them to be when you're designing them. <laughs> Sounds stupid, but I've seen it happen a couple times and it doesn't work out. But soft jaws are great. 
3D printing them is becoming really common. We were we 3D printed three sets of soft jaws at MSU this semester for different parts. Because this is really weird. You have, for reference, these are about three and a half inches tall, and there's a bunch of tiny corner radii on that. So it would suck to try and get down into that shallow of a pocket and machine those. So think about 3D printing them when you can. Cheap, quick, and you don't have to deal with machine the jaws. But we'll talk a little bit more about the fixture plates. So you guys have seen this setup on a fixture plate. They're great, simple, but you'll notice how I did, how I kind of did the drawings here. What I'm doing here is exactly what this plate lets me do. So I could put three short pins into here. I'd actually put what are called rest buttons. They're pins, but the tops are machined flat. So if I wanted to do this exact style of something, or let's say this eraser, I can put three rest buttons in. That's what my part's gonna sit on. I'll put two pins back here, probably a pin here and here, so that way they're as far apart as possible, so this can't twist as much. And then I'll put a pin over here. And then I push it up against those, that locates me. And then I put a couple clamps. So I'll put a little pusher clamp to push it up against those pins, and a pusher clamp here to push it up against the other pin. So if you're trying to get that perfect fixturing, the like engineer's dream fixturing, that's the great thing about fixture plates. They let, they're what lets you do this, because do you want to have to machine a new plate every time for every size of part? No. Buy or make yourself a plate like this, engineering department gets real happy. But don't do what the guys who made this plate did. I actually went and measured these this semester, and their vise wasn't square when they machined them, so the entire whole pattern isn't square to the edges of the part. So what I get to do when I go home on Thursday is remachine every one of those so that the edges are square. How do you do Oh, let's see, they did a class set, which would be, frick, that's 10 that I get to go in and indicate in and then redo. Yeah, so if you're making fixturing, your fixturing has to be accurate. Otherwise, you get what happened when I, I what happened was I set up a part in one of these, one of our classes, and I start machining, and I'm like, and it had two holes. It's a piece about yay long. It had two holes, and they were they were supposed to be centered. They were noticeably not centered. So I go and I start throwing indicators on it. And I was like, the plate's not square. <laughs> Fixturing is only as good as how you set it up. It's like a vise is great, but a not square vise sucks because you can't do almost anything with it. That's why tolerance matters. But the other thing that fixturing can be great for, as you guys have seen, is that doing a lot of parts at once. So this is a production setup. You can see they're doing hundreds of these little parts. This is actually how Mighty Bite makes some of their clamps. These are eccentric bushings. So they're a hex that has a screw hole, but the screw hole isn't in the center. It lets you basically use them as a cam, as a little rolling cam. But you can use a fixture plate to make a lot of something. And that's really handy. I think I only ever did like two fixtures while I was on bare metal that did multiple parts because we don't exactly do that many repeats of stuff. <laughs> but it's a useful thing to think of when you have to redo stuff. Or if you're doing some weird off season thing like when we were, we kind of, so fun fact, before you guys bought the modules, we actually made some. We like ripped off Patrick's design and like made a couple of our own modules. I'm not sure if they're still around, but 
how Sorbet Specialties makes those is they have multiple heart fixtures that fit onto their mill, and that's how they make all of them. Because when you get to needing the quantity, you really need to have that done. So that's another use for fixture plates, is making more than one part at once. Then soft jaws, which you kind of started out with. They're just the negative part machine then, they're generally aluminum jaws. They also make steel soft jaws, they're annealed steel. They're not too bad to cut, but they allow you to hold a lot of weird shaped parts. So that was again what I chose to use to hold these. This is specifically designed to fit into soft jaws. It's got the two flats to locate them, but even if this was round, I could put a little pin in that would match up with one of the holes and I could locate them. They're great for all the weird shaped stuff. And they're really quick to make. If you guys actually make an assembly in Inventor, uh, I highly recommend while you guys are on break, do this. You can get the soft jaw models from like Monster Jaws or you can just look up soft jaw model. Throw two of them into an assembly. Throw a part in. Just use some mates to get the part in. You can literally extrude out the space. It takes like 20 minutes once you've got once you've done it and figured it out really quick. And they let you hold all the weird shaped stuff. It's really convenient. So yeah. And let's say you have some weird shaped thing. Let's say I wanted to hold this pair of glasses in the laser cutter so that I could engrave something on them. I could make some 3D prints of soft jaws to hold this up. Stuff like that. So even if it's weird geometry like this, how would I mill into the jaws? I, you, could, you may have to flip your jaws sideways to mill it in, but if you can just take it something, make the negative of it, just use 3D printing. It's great. So if you get a weird shape that you can't make, think about that. Something else that I just want to point out on this is corners on soft jaws. Be mindful not to make anything that has sharp internal corners, because how do you make sharp internal corners on a milling machine? You don't. You don't, no. exactly. So what I like to do, they didn't do it on this one, they just made larger corner radii. Drill a hole at the corner, so easy to do. Make a sketch, find all your corners, take whatever drill bit you already have in the machine, drill a hole in the corner, boom, done. That's just the most common thing you'll run into is you have something that has a sharp corner and you can't make it, so you have to do something to relieve the corner. Just drill a hole. Easy, simple, really convenient. The soft jaws for this, it's this profile, and these actually have a corner radius, so I could have machined it. But let's say I machined the radius slightly wrong on this, and I don't want to measure it on all of them before I put them in. I drilled out a quarter inch hole at each of these little corners on here, on my soft jaws. Made my life really easy. The one thing you gotta think of, if you do that though, do I drill the hole before or after I mill out the soft jaw? Before. Why? Because you can use it as a bailing. Because if you... Because then you don't hit half of the material and you don't reflect. Exactly. What happens to a drill bit? Have you guys ever tried to drill on the very edge of tubing? It don't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. So, if you drill out the corners, just remember to do it in the right order. <laughs> Otherwise, you get to see what a drill bit bending looks like. <laughs> It sounds stupid and like something that you would never do, but I've made all the mistakes. I've seen people make them. Trust me that it happens. And then for designing these, the simplest way is by far to put everything in an assembly. But you can also make a sketch and do it that way. The downside of the sketch one is if your part changes, 
your jaws don't auto change. But that also can be an advantage because if design changes something and doesn't tell you and you try to use the same soft jaws, that, uh, that may not work because the model will update but the physical ones don't. So pros and cons. Design by sketch is nice for the control but kind of a pain sometimes. The assembly one, the one thing that you need to know before you do this. If I go in into an inventor and I add, and I take the same soft gel model and I pop one here, one here, what, am I, what issue am I going to run into when I try to extrude the profile in if they aren't perfectly symmetric? You have one part in a name that's copied in twice that has two different profiles that you're trying to make into it. Inventor is going to be really confused, so when you put this all into an inventor, the thing you gotta do is you gotta do a save as on your jaws. I like to save them as jaw fixed, jaw movable. I just add an underscore and add that, because then if the profiles in, that are extruded into the jaws are different, inventor isn't like, you're trying to have me do two things to one part and I can't figure this out. So, just something to keep in mind. So you're talking about like they have to be, um, like when you're machining them, they can't be touching, otherwise they won't clamp. So how far do you like do you have in between? Do you just like grab a one, two, three block or something? I really like actually just parallels. Because yeah. a parallel is generally an eighth inch thick. Yeah. So if you have an eighth inch, your draws are going to be engaging on most of the part, which is good for clamping force. But a parallel is something that you can easily find in the shop. And if you just grab a little half inch one, if you have a really deep pocket, that's great. You, the one thing that you want to keep in mind, the way a Kirk vise works, that jaw, the movable jaw will try to rotate forward a little bit. It's called their ang lock system. But that jaw is going to try to rotate forward a little bit. So you want to use as tall of a parallel as you can. But I like to do an eighth inch just because parallels are so easy to find. Obviously, like, if it doesn't fit the jaw, you use mm -hmm. more than one. Yeah. And sometimes you need your jaws to be spaced farther apart. So then a one, two, three block's great. It just really depends on the size of your part. This part was spaced out five-eighths of an inch when I machined the jaws. That was how far the vise was designed to be, the jaws were designed to be spaced apart when it was open. Because otherwise, it would have gone out of the sides of some of the vices that I may have had to use. So that was why I chose that width. Most of the time, I design an eighth inch apart because then I chuck a parallel in because I have a set of parallels at every machine. So I don't have to go around the shop to find whatever random stack of shims I need. Advantages of a soft jaw compared to a fixture plate, they're really cheap. Last time I purchased soft jaws, they were about $10 to $20 a pair, depending on the size. Dirt cheap. They're compatible with basically any vice, and they're very quick and convenient. Their disadvantages, soft jaws are really limited to only two parts per jaw. The reasoning for this and we're going to look at this robot again, because this has an example of where we tried to do this and failed. There are these little yellow elevator pieces that hold the bearings in. They are these little yellow powder-coated things. There's a set of soft jaws around here somewhere that was meant to hold four of those. Anybody want to, did anybody think of a reason why holding four at once would be a problem? The first side's been machined. We're holding them up. Any ideas on why machining four at a time would be a problem? Okay. Here's what you're going to run into if you try to machine more than two at once. Is you have your vise, you got jaw, jaw. As this jaw moves in, if you feel on a vise, that movable jaw can rotate a little bit, right? So what happens is, 
you're going to get pressure on whatever your outside pieces are. But the inside ones are going to get a tool touch them and they're going to fly out. And that's exactly what happened. You can ask Collins. I'm fairly certain he remembers because I chucked like four or five of these before we realized what was going on. Because what happens is your vise tries to rotate and you get clamped on the outside ones because your vise rotates to clamp those. But if there's any tolerance on that part and the middle ones are slightly thicker, it's going to try to clamp on the middle ones and the edges will get chucked. And whatever the smallest one is, whatever one is slightly smaller than nominal, half a thou even, they're just going to not have enough clamping force. So never design soft jaws for anything more than two parts unless you are really confident in your jaw and that your parts are perfectly tolerated because it will throw. You also have to have enough clearance, otherwise your part isn't going to fit well. So generally you end up machining your soft jaws slightly bigger than your actual part geometry. What I'll generally end up doing is I'll make them do the initial run through, test fit apart. If I need to, I'll run negative stock to leave passes in order to size it out a little bit. And they're really hard to do for anything that isn't a like two and a half D structure. So when I say two and a half D, basically think something that is more than just an extreme piece of plate. Gearbox plates, two and a half D part. You're not really doing a whole lot through the cross section. This is on the edge of what most people would call a two and a half D part because you have a lot of features in the 3D that are mattering on the depth. If you can cut it on a laser cutter, it's two and a half D. That's the short of it. But it's really hard to hold things that aren't that because machining the profile out of the jaws becomes really hard if you can't just do it. If you can't machine the jaws while they're held like this, it gets really complicated. 3D printing makes that easier, but aluminum or steel soft jaws are really hard to do for complex geometry that varies across the z-axis of your metal. Example fixtures. We kind of looked at this one a little bit earlier, but all this is, is this part has another little boss like this, just a raised circle. This is just a 3D printed piece with two Bs, and these are stacked springs, so they're spring washers. So this just spring loads on the part, so you just push it down, it locks it in and locates it. There, this is not a fixture plate or a set of soft jaws, but they're another type of fixture that can be good. Spring loaded stuff for measuring is really common. I have to measure all of my parts at university because we actually care about it. And when you're making molds and stuff, people care about it. <laughs> Something else. This is actually a really cool fixture. So this is a ring, big ring made of brass. What I'm actually using for it, this is going to be a cross-sectional view. So you have your circle here. I'm going to look at this. I'm going to like, we're going to look at this as if we're along these lines here. There is a wedge here. And then a wedge here, and then I have a screw that's coming down and applying downward force here. So it expands out this outer ring. So you have a hole in the center, you have a little tapered piece here, the screw's going to be here, wedge, and then this is just a bunch of expansion. The clamp actually expands out. And this actually locks down so tight just using a little T-handle Allen wrench that you actually can't move it at all with your hand, you can't pull it out. But you just use a little wedge to expand that clamp. They make expansion pins that you just buy, you shove them in a hole, and then you turn the screw down and it expands the pin. They're a great way to locate things, and they're really convenient. So just some other types, there is tons of fixed train solutions. Companies make a lot of money just selling these. Car Lane, McMaster Car have fixture and stuff. Mighty Bite. So, if you have some weird geometry, just look up at fixtures. These ones we've also looked at. 
this is a weird complex part that's they got a big radius on it. This is all radius. This is turned down on a live axis lathe. So it's a lathe with live tooling and a Y axis. So you can do all milling. But when we flip it, we need to machine some stuff on this top surface. These soft jaws would be a pain to try and cut normally, but you just 3D print them. Create a little solution. And this is one of those I need to flip apart weirdly and locate it. This is done just with. Again, some little springs that clamp down on that bar, and that part goes in. There's two pins sticking out right here. There's two pins sticking out like this marker would be. That that's what locates the part, and then the spring just holds it down. Great for measuring. So that's just kind of some basics on fixed screen things to think about. Probably not the most exciting thing in the world, but at least interesting things to think about because. You will always run into some random part that you can't hold. And then you gotta figure out how do I hold crazy parts? So, yeah. Any questions on fixture and how to hold weird stuff? Yeah. Uh, so, with soft jazz, I know you explained it, but how do you start with a part? Like, if you have a weird looking part and you have, you wanna make weird looking soft jazz? Do you machine the outside of the part first and then cut the soft jaws and then lock in the soft jaws or is, how does that work? Gotcha. Generally what I do with soft jaws, so um, here I think I actually have a cam. A bolt fusion, I may or may not have the stuff I need on there. But on this part, I don't have the cam on here. I do most of my programming in fusion these days, fusion 360, it's inventors like little brother. <laughs> But what I do is I actually machine all of this. I machine down to this, this bottom surface and I got 20 thou extra. And then I flip it over and use soft jaws for it. So op one is just a piece of square stock held in a vise. Op two is soft jaws. Okay. Most of the time, if you're doing a soft jaws part, you'll do op one just holding onto a bar or a random piece of stock. And then op two is done in the jaws. Makes sense. So this is op one on this plate. Version 54, I've, I redid the cam on this like three times to optimize things because I had to make 17 of them. So shaving five minutes off was the difference between me getting them done in one day of machine time versus two. But you can see I'm just doing this as if I was holding it onto it with stock. So I'm holding onto this chunk down here. And then what I have doing, what I end up doing is up to generate real quick. But up to is done in soft jaws. I don't have the soft jaw model in here because I don't need it for doing this. But then I come in and machine all this, and I never go below the top surface. So this, the top of this part was sat about twenty thou above the top of the soft jaws. So op one, hold on to block, op two, do it in soft jaws. And I think I didn't bother connecting to the Wi-Fi because my stuff doesn't work anymore, but you can kind of see the soft jaws there. Uh, I do them in an assembly and then I just throw the part in, do all my cam in the assembly, because then I can locate to the point on the soft jaws. So the back left corner of the soft jaws is my location for doing those. Yeah. For the 3D printed soft jaws, are you just using like regular old PLA filament or what type of filament do you use? You can. If you use PLA, the one issue that you can run into is that the jaws may not be stiff enough. So if you over clamp them in the vise, you'll crush them. Mm -hmm. What we generally use at MSU is we like to run, we have some printers that can do the composite reinforced PLA. So we'll do the carbon fiber jaws. Or we'll use resin printing, because resin 
is generally stronger. And if we do do the 3D printed soft jaws, we tend to do 80 to 100 percent infill. Okay. So we run a really high in full percentage because you want them to be as rigid as possible. Yeah. Op zero, um, I think that might have been me cutting stock to length. Oh no, it was me facing the heart. It's flat. Gotcha. Yeah. Sometimes I do an op zero if I need my part squared. If I don't have a manual mill available to screw my stock, that'll often be an op zero. Yeah. Normally it's a facer. Normally it's a facing op. So that's kind of fire hose of fixed train thoughts. You'll run into some weird part at some point. That elevator is like the king of randomly weird design parts. If you take the longer you look at that elevator, the more weird components you find on it. Is that chains really? No, I don't think so. Shane was an interesting character. Shane, on an average competition, went through, on average, three to four NOSes a day, though. He was an interesting guy. It, his hands shook so much at comp without caffeine, it was hilarious. <laughs> but, you know. Shane was mad. We have some stories about Shane. Uh, yeah. So, now we can kind of shift gears, talk about some 3D machining. Um, I know back when I was doing a lot of CAM, I tended to use a lot of 2D tool pathing because it's really great for tube and a lot of the other stuff. Do you guys use much 3D these days? Not really. Not really, no. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, what's the reasoning for using 3D tool pathing and what's its advantages? 3D tool pathing, this is specific to Autodesk's suite of products, is it uses the volumetric model to define where the tool paths go, as opposed to selecting geometry. That's all the differences between a 3D and 2D tool path. A 3D adaptive and a 2D adaptive are using the exact same type of cut. They're going to use a constant radial load, but as opposed to having to select every curve, a 3D tool path is going to be, the, you're going to set a containment area. So, example on this part. If I do a 2D tool path for these bearing holes, I'm going to take this, I'm going to select here, select here, select here. If I'm doing a 3D tool path, I could select the rectangle on the edge of this, and then it is going to automatically make any of the features inside of it that the tool can fit. So at its core, that's the difference between 3D and 2D toolpath. Where do you use one over the other? 3D toolpaths are great to rough apart, especially complex parts. They're great to finish complex 3D surfaces. For example, how do you do this Seahawks head with a 2D tool path? You either make a ton of sketches or you use a 3D tool path. And don't make a lot of sketches. Because that I think was done with like a 10,000 step over. And that was about 8 inches wide. So that would be a lot of passes. Don't do it. And they're done to reduce the number of operations on part. So, if I slide back over to this part on the initial cam, I actually, I have this operation which lets me rough out basically everything. And then I have a couple 2D contours just to finish machine some stuff. But I really, but as opposed to having to have a couple 2D contours at varying heights and depths to do everything, it lets me reduce how many operations, and I mean, I'm already at what, I think it, it's 13 tools overall, so 
it's, I mean, I'm at about 15 different tool paths. So having to do a bunch of separate ones is just more work. So that's one of those things where reducing the number of operations is really nice. Why use 3D instead of 2D? The biggest thing is not selecting geometry. So who has designed one of those things to run on the fixture plate with like 20 different plates on it and has had their hand hurt afterwards because you had to click 10,000 times on the part? That's where 3D tool paths are really nice is you're not selecting every single bearing hole on the VF3 table. That's really nice. The other big, big thing is you can cut the weird profiles. So you can cut the weird shapes. 2D tool pathing, you have to have some line for the machine to follow. There isn't always a good line for that. And that's what you run into. So when you get into weird shapes, that's what you need. How do I do this little chamfer on here with a 2D tool pad? You really can't unless you have the exact angle of tool that I need. So 3D tool paths let you select stuff that you otherwise couldn't. They also let you combine roughing passes for multiple things. So let's say this was a plate part and I'm machine using an end mill to machine my holes because I don't want my plate to come up and fly up at me or I don't want to put a drill into my machine table. Do you guys still machine, use an eighth inch end mill on all the holes or do you drill them? I would drill a lot. On of plates? Them. Yeah. This, uh, we, we use an end mill. Okay, yeah. So it would let you, if you were, let's say you wanted to use an eighth inch end mill to rough out some of your um, bearing holes because you like wasting time, you could. So it lets you do the multiple roughing passes. The other thing is it lets you increase your material removal rate. So how many cubic inches a minute of aluminum, steel, or polycarbonate are you getting out of the part? Machine is a subtractive process. You machine away stuff, so you remove material. So when we're in industry, the number that I tend to care about a lot is MRR. How much material am I getting out of the part as chips? And how fast am I doing that? Because the higher that number is, the more material I'm removing, the more I should be making money. Because that's what the end goal in industry of this process is, is you are making money by making chips. Other features. Why would I use a 2D tool path instead of a 3D tool path? 2D, if I had to have one tool path for the rest of my life, it would be 2D contour. Because 2D contour lets you do so many things. I have used 2D contour to make complex 5-axis parts. I have a little V8 engine block at my house to prove it. But there are reasons why I select a 2D tool path instead of a 3D, especially on finish passes. Example, go back to this part. Why do I start with a 3D adaptive, but all of my finishing is with 2D contours? It's because a 2D contour is really easy to control. If I was doing a 3D tool path and I want to just do these little counter bores, I would have to set containment areas on each of those. I would then have to set my maximum depth that I allow my tool to go. I'd have to select the correct tool. And it's just going to, I'm going to be selecting as much or more. On these finishing operations out here, there's not a great way to tell Fusion to just finish those up. So 2D tool paths are great because you select exactly what you want. So that's why one of the main reason why I would use a 2D tool path over a 3D is control. 
2D tool paths are like a scalpel. They are great for making precise cuts. 3D tool paths are great because they'll, they're like a saw. They let you get through a lot of material really quickly. So 2D tool paths have a great place. There are two broad types of 3D tool paths. And each tool path can be used for finishing or it can be used for roughing, but generally they tend to fall into one category or the other. There's roughing, you're trying to remove a lot of material really quickly, or there's finishing. You're trying to do some weird complex surface or some other feature. Can you use a finishing tool path to do roughing? Yes. Do you need to do that sometimes? Yes. Have I used 3D Adaptive to finish geometry before? Yes. But it doesn't tend to do very well. So first thing you want to look at is, am I needing to rough a part or am I needing to finish a part? So now we're just going to walk through all the different 3D tool paths in Inventor. Where would I use them? What are they for? What do they do? 3D Adaptive. Removing material. It is the most efficient way, volumetrically, to remove material from a part. You can put a 3D Adaptive on a part, and if you remove stock to leave, it will create every single feature on that part as close as it can with the step over and step down that you gave. It's great. It's so nice for doing 3D for removing the bulk of a part. Now we're going to talk about the finish, most of the finishing operations. And something that is critical to understand on 3D surfacing is what type of surface are you making? Is it a steep or is it a shallow surface? Because that is going to determine what type of tool path you're going to use to finish it. This is at about a 30 degree angle on this chamfer here. So that means it's going to be a more shallow surface. Generally, anything over about 30 to 60 degrees is considered steep. Steep just means it's going to be have a high slope. It's steep, you're closer to vertical. Shallow, you're closer to horizontal. You guys can understand that. But things where you'll see a lot of steep surfaces, bolt walls, if you look at that laptop and take a pair of calipers to it, it is not going to be square on that top plastic shell. There is probably going to be a one to three degree slope on that because it was injection molded and it needs that. It needs that so that way the parts pop out of the mold. Shallow surfaces, things like grooves, fillets, this weird geometry that's on the spiral tool pad. It's really common, things like chamfers that you need to machine, stuff like that. I tend to do a lot of shallow surfacing with the work that I do, and a lot of the molds I've done have had shallow work. But sometimes you run into steeper stuff that you need different strategies for. So now that we understand there are two types of walls, steep and shallow. Let's look at how do we machine each of them. Parallel. Parallel is what I use for about 90% of my 3D finishing. The reasoning for it, it creates passes at a constant step over. So it is going to create passes at a constant distance apart and in the X and Y. It's great for shallow surfaces. Great for them. It lets you do get lots of just great geometry out of them. But why is it not as good for the steeper passes? The reasoning is, at, if I am doing constant passes going this way, when I'm at the top, if I step and let's say this is a curved surface. If I go over a constant amount on a steep thing, that's going to get me going down further. That means that I'm going to have a large cusp up here, but as I get down to a shallower angle at the bottom, I'm just gonna draw this out. So 
So we're going to say that I am machining a circle like this. If I do the same constant step over, so this is going to be where I'm doing passes, there is going to be big change in height up here, small change in height down here. Constant step over is great down at the shallow side, but it doesn't do as well up on the steep side. So that's why this is better for shallow surfaces. Have I done tall walls with parallel? Yes, it works, but you end up having to do super tiny step overs up here when you really don't need it down at the bottom. So that's parallel, it's great. I really like it a lot. We'll talk about step overs and all that more at the end. This is, we're gonna just get a broad overview of what's, what's the toolpath options. Next step, we have contour. <clears throat> contour is Parallel's brother. They are very similar. They do the exact same thing. It uses a constant step down though. So it's looking at your Z height and it is going to do constant passes on the step down. So it is great in the exact same way the parallel is great, but it's great up at the top. As you can see, we're getting pretty minimal change, but as we get towards the bottom, you run into the exact opposite problem that parallel had. Uh, you need a lot of passes down here, when up here, this is a great step down. So parallel and contour are just two sides of the same coin. It's just, do I want a constant step over or a constant step down? Next up, you've got ramp. This does exactly what the animation is doing. So basically, you guys use 2D ramp a lot. It's really common, great for entering parts. This does the exact same thing, just going around a surface. Great tool path, really convenient. Why would I use it over a step down, over like a parallel? or over a contour would mainly be if I can go around a whole part, this lets me set my ramp angle so I'm not having lead in and lead out. If you look at parallel and contour, that contour just doesn't show it well, but on parallel, you know how green an inventor is your lead in lead out? That is all wasted machine movement. Ramp, if I can do it on a part, reduces how much lead in and lead out I have. That's the main reason I would use it is if I can reduce how much time I am not cutting material. Horizontal, this is great for when you're doing weird parts with a lot of flat surfaces. Lets you machine all of the flat bits. It's pretty much exactly what it says it is machines any of the flat areas on the part. Super convenient, makes it to where you don't have to do a bunch of 2D adaptives or 2D pockets in order to finish a surface. So this is an example part. This is a part I did for Montana State University. Fun fact, MSU is responsible for testing potatoes in America. They go through two to 10 million potato samples a year. So the fact, how do we not have the Irish potato famine happen again? MSU tests potatoes from across the country to make sure they're not diseased. To do that, they use these trays that hold 25 samples. They needed trays, they needed these plastic parts to have a mating basically metal tray system to hold them so that way they could move them through their machines automatically. So they went, they got the plastic piece made, then they realized, oh, we need to make the trays. So we prototyped out some different molds for them. This is an injection molded part. Injection molded stuff never has square walls. Why? If I try to injection mold 
something square, it is really hard to get out of the mold. So what you end up doing is the walls have a slight angle like this. So your angle in here is generally about one to three degrees. So I can't just go in and get these trays to be a good fit to that part by just doing 2D tool mapping. So, given those angles, what kind of tool path would you guys use? 3D contour. Yeah, 3D contour would go great. 3D ramp would also work really well. It's a steep part. So you want to use an operation that's going to be doing a constant step down or going at a constant angle. That's basically what you got to think of. Is just how steep is it? That tells you what you're going to do. That part took about three hours to machine so that it would actually fit. The roughing took 12 minutes and everything else was just doing a ramp down passes along the entire inside of the part until it fits. Next up, you got some fillets on the top of a bar. Everything else is machined. You just need to do these fillets. What operation do you select? You can do a parallel. Yeah. I would use parallel for doing that. That's exactly what I would use. It's the, at the bottom here, you may end up needing to use a 2D con or a 3D contour because it gets steep. But I can do the bulk of this with a parallel really effectively. And the added perk. These are really long passes, so your machine's not accelerating as much. And you're not going to run into, who has ran into the high-speed machining limit of speed on one of the mills when you're trying to do some weird curvature? It's a thing that happens, so that's why parallel would be great. And these balls are sort of like forever. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Anyway, how would you split up between like doing a parallel and a 3D contour? Like, would you have to make a sketch or something? You can. Um, let's hop over into Fusion. has a tool path that should be coming to Inventor here soon. That's great. And it is called Steep and Shallow. So what it lets you do is, if I go into I believe it's the passes tab, I can set a threshold angle, and it'll auto-change between the two at an angle. Inventor is supposed to be getting it, but it keeps getting delayed release after release, so I don't know. But there is ways to do it in Inventor, just slightly more clumsily. So let's say I'm going to go ahead and on here to our parallel. So if I the easiest way to do this is you can, on parallel, you can machine steep areas. And what that lets you do is kind of shift to a step down. But basically it lets you use when the steep, valve, when it detects steep, which I believe is anything over 30 degrees is what it auto sets to, you can have it use a different step over. So that's the easiest way to do it, is just be like, okay, I'm going to have some steep areas, and then you just set a smaller step over, or step down, for those areas. That's the easy way. The other thing that you can do is use a sketch, but that tends to be faster. Does that kind of make sense on that? Yeah. And the other thing that you can do is you can set up a, with a slope angle. So this will machine from zero to 90, but I can say limit from zero to 30, stuff like that. That's the other way you can go about it. So when you do the, uh, like the 3D contour, you can run it up to like 30 to mm -hmm. 90. Exactly. So that's 
the, uh, that tends to be better than doing a sketch. If you have really weird geometry, so it's not just like a chamfer on here, a sketch might be better than just doing it based off a slope angle. Because if you have weird intersecting fillets, Inventor kind of has an aneurysm. Because <laughs> it's like, what angle is it? And it's trying to do passes that are infinitesimally small and it's, it doesn't work well. But that's how you kind of control those. So you would just do a parallel and then a contour and just set what contact angles. Or if you don't have, like on that fillet part, I would just do the steep passes and just reduce my step over for a little bit. Because you have, it gets steep for a like 60 thou wide area. You can just make your step over tiny for that. And let's say you do a 2 thou step over. Yeah, it's 30 passes. But if you can just leave the machine running overnight, who cares? When I made that Seahawks head, the like Seahawks logo I showed you guys at the start, that took 22 hours. We did it on the tour mock, so that's why it took 22 hours. <laughs> but with surfacing on one-off parts, just make it a tiny step over and let the machine run forever. I used to run the VF3 during Fab Week, literally 24 hours straight. I would put a plate on before I left home or home for the night, change it over when I got to the school school in the morning an hour before classes start, change another one over in the afternoon and literally run three shifts. <coughs> so take advantage of that. This one, this is a bending die for doing sheet metal work that we needed for doing a weird custom bend for a researcher. What path would you guys use? Around. Yeah, ramp would work. It'll be a little awkward because these walls are at 60 degrees. The top you probably want to do with a parallel. The sides you probably want to do with a ramp or a contour. You could also just do the entire thing with, a, with a, either one and it's right on the limit of you'll be fine with whatever. So it's kind of a trick question. <laughs> Can you show the ramp, 3D ramp, and the mentor real quick? Sure. Okay. So, um, it's not going to work well on this one, but we can try it. This is not the ideal geometry for this type of tool path, be warned. But I don't have a whole lot of parts in Inventor right now that it'll work well on. So in this case, it's doing something very similarly to how I was doing the part before. But you can see it's basically doing a constant ramp down along the edges. Can you get it to skip the holes or? Yeah, so we'll talk about that later on, but the first time that you create a 3D tool path, you're going to get it to do all this weird stuff that you don't want it to. And there's a lot of tricks on how you get that to do that. So we'll go through that later. Kind of the structure of this is I want you guys to understand what tool path to start with. And then we can go, and then here in like five slides, we'll talk about how you get great results with all of them. So we'll get to that in just a minute. So, the answer to your how do we get it to not touch all the holes is there's a button called avoid touch surfaces. That is how you get it to not touch all of the things that you don't want it to. But that's just one of the important things. The most important parameters on a 3D operation is your tool type, ball end work, most 3D surfacing is ball nose work. Sometimes it's not, that's rare, but it does happen. 
your step over or your step down is going to be just about the most critical part of this because that's going to define how nice your passes are. For example, this spiral was done, I believe I ended up with a 10 thou step, step over, or no, step down, it's a spiral. But how fine that step over is, is going to determine how good it looks. But also it's going to add a lot of time. As you shrink that number, the time to cut goes exponentially up. So the nicer you want it to look, the more time it's going to take. And for those of you who don't know what, I, what we're saying with the high speed machine, if you're doing complex surfaces, so let's say I need my milling machine to trace over a curve, right? My machine is going to be accelerating. Haas has a thing called high speed machining, which basically what it does is it looks ahead at the code, says, okay, here's the motion we need to do, and smooths the motor curves so that you can keep a higher feed rate over the entire time. Because what happens is your code is going to look like tens of thousands of tiny little points where that are like a thou or two apart. Because your machine can interpolate, can take in arcs, but if you're doing weird, crazy 3D moves, it doesn't have arc commands to do 3D arcs. So it has to take it in as tens of thousands of individual points, which if the machine is only looking at the next point, it's going to move between that and it's not going to be able to figure out where it needs to go next fast enough to be moving at max speed. So your simulation time and the actual time as your part complexity increases is going to increase your actual machine time significantly. It can be upwards of 50% if you're going up and down constantly which sucks, because you're like, this is going to take five hours, and then it takes ten. So, yeah. slope angles, as we kind of saw, that's going to determine what tool path you're using and what angles you're going to use it that at. The other thing, rest machining. This is really critical for 3D adaptives. Rest machining, do you guys know what rest machining is? Have you guys ever heard of it? Yeah. Rest machine, basically, the tool path's going to look at your part, look at what's already been done, and it's not going to try to redo any of the stuff that's already been cut. It's great, because you don't have to tell it to avoid 10,000 things that you already cut. The downside, if any of you have ever tried to run a rest machining tool path on a crappy computer at your house, is it takes a lot of computing power. So if you're like, why is this taking 20 minutes to generate? It's because rest machine takes a while to create a tool path. So that's a trade-off that you run into. The other thing, smoothing. Does anybody know what smoothing is? Basically like makes the just smooths out the tool path, I guess. I don't know. It's, yeah. It's... So like I was saying. If our mill is trying to follow this tool path, I'm going to choose a marker. Sure. Does it add like more points to the arc or something? To smooth? No, it doesn't do that. What smoothing does is let's say we have three points here. What smoothing does is instead of telling the machine to go from here to here to here, it tells it follow an arc that will take you through those points. So it helps reduce the machine getting hung up on moving point to point to point by fitting arcs to everything where it can. So the other big thing on that, has anybody ever tried to run a super massive file on one of the machines and got them there? Oh, yeah. yeah. Smoothing can help with that because it reduces how many lines of code. So I think the Tormach has a one gig file limit on a part file. I hit it once. I can't remember what I was making that had a gigabyte G-code file. 
The Haas, unless you guys get the upgrade, also I think has a one gig limit. But yeah, so smoothing is helpful because it reduces that stutter of the machine moving point to point and it reduces your file size. So it doesn't take 20 minutes to copy from a flash drive. The downside of it is if you click on it, it tells you a tolerance. So smoothing isn't going to perfectly get that same surface. It'll get close, but how close does it have to be for it to make it an arc is defined by the tolerance you set. The higher your tolerance, the more off it can be, but the less stubborn your path will be. So it's a trade-off. And then the, the pièce de résistance is avoid touch surfaces. Avoid touch surfaces is how we get this to not do all of the weird stuff inside. And does this one not have... Ramp might not have it. But the other one is Parallel, I know, for sure does. So, like, if we go into this spiral here, I know spiral does. So if you look, I'm telling it to not touch the top surface and not touch the side. And that's because if I remove those, so I'm going to remove those real quick and show you guys what happens if I don't do this. What this is going to try and do is it's going to try and do the entire part. Ooh, oh, good Whoa. And that's doing 30,000 step overs over the entire part. That's going to significantly increase my machine time. Like six years. Is your spiral there how you're doing your camper? Yep, so the spiral, uh, this is meant to do just that little chamfer. Okay, so is that like another path you could use, I guess? Yep, we can kind of look at all the other ones. Minutes. Most of these are pretty much the same concept, just slightly different. We'll kind of look at them in a second. But it, just going back to the avoid touch surfaces, if I select those two surfaces alone, it fixes most of it. So it's still trying to go into the holes a little bit, but I'm leaving that. The reason because I, that I'm doing that is because it means I'm not having to have a lead in lead out every time I go over a hole. It allows me to have one continuous tool path. So I'm spending less time cutting it out than if it was lead in lead out on everything because it wouldn't try to retract at all. So that's why I like that. Isn't there a button that says like heat tool down? You can, even still, switching between a G1 and a G0 uh, move can have some weird consequences. So I just chose to leave it in because it keeps my tool path continuous. So we could go in and add the internal services of those to my avoid. So let's just add a couple of them, just so we can see. So you can see it does that, but also it's not finishing around the hole now. Okay. So something I want you guys to notice on this part is take your fingernail and move down on the edge here. You'll feel a very slight lip at the bottom. That is also one of the things I get, is I'm telling it not to touch this surface here. You can, you can just barely feel it. It's like just barely noticeable. Oh, yeah. So when you're using avoid and touch surfaces, it, you have to be careful. Because sometimes by avoiding a surface, you don't finish the part fully. So it depends. So is that what you can do to avoid that? Or? Kind of. Um, what you can do is adjust this clearance value to be as low as possible so it will come really 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 close to touching it but even still I found it gives me weird problems and edges sometimes so yeah Inventor why have any of you guys heard of any of the other camp packages out there Mastercam any of that 
So we actually, we have a master cam license, by the way. Mm -hmm. It costs like 10K back in the day, because it's really expensive, but the main reason I shift to other cam softwares when I need to is because they do this type of stuff better than Inventor does. Inventor cam is great for your day-to-day -day work of what we do here, what I do at the university. It's not great on the aerospace, I need to make a jet turbine blade that is all complex five axis work. Master Cam, even the super old version we have, we, had, we have an X7 license. Hopefully Darren knows what a flash drive is if you guys ever want to play with it. It takes so much longer to program in it. Please don't try to do like build season parts in it. It sucks. <laughs> Trust me, we used to do it that way but it has a lot more options on these. So, is that- That's good because it like integrates like both design and camera lazy. That was why we shifted to uh, Inventor with Inventor Cam. We had always used Inventor for the design side and 2017 to 2018, I pushed really hard to shift to Inventor Cam from Master Cam because it made it a lot easier to um, integrate the design and build process. So you guys know how you're going through the season, design changes something, you need to remachine a part. You don't have to redo all of your cam. You have to redo a little bit, but that's the main reason why we switched to Inventor with Inventor Cam was just, it makes it, keeping everything together was super easy. Otherwise, what we used to have to do was export a step file of every part we needed to machine, load the step file into master cam, then cam it, and then anything changes, you have to restart the entire process. So it's not ideal. Then looking at the other options that you have, um, we've already looked at horizontal, contour, parallel, pocket, 2D and 3D pocket do the exact same thing. It's adaptive, but worse. <laughs> Instead of keeping a constant radial tool load, it creates constant step over passes, which are slightly different. Basically, when your tool goes into a corner on pocket, how much of the tool, so think about marker as tool. Normally in adaptive, you're only engaging with maybe like a 20 degree arc on the tool. Pocket, when you go to a corner, you might go up to 90 or even 120 degrees of the tool engaging. That means you're going to be putting more forces in different directions on the tool. You're more likely to get shattered. And it tends to impact the surface finish. So, pocket is nice for finishing. Don't use it for roughing. Scallop is another one. It's, it creates constant width passes, so they're constant distance from one another. They, it's good for weird shapes, but for most of the stuff that I've done, I don't, haven't really had a use for it because I haven't had weird enough shapes, is what it comes down to. <laughs> the shape that it's showing is a great example of something where you would use it. Pencil is for a very niche use case, which is I have an internal corner on something. So this is that same part. There's a corner radius around the bottom of it. It will track that radius. It's basically just meant for creating weird fillets around a part. It's very thick. Very, very thick. Radial is very similar to spiral. It just, you take a center point, it does constant passes around it with, I can't remember if it's angle or a step over, but it's semi-useful for really flat stuff that has a center point. Spiral is what I'm using on the chamfer. It just starts at the center and makes a spiral out at constant widths. It's great for doing stuff around round surfaces, so chamfers on a mill, weird stuff like that. I use it when I can go around a part. 
Um, morph spiral is basically the same thing, but it does better on, it doesn't make perfectly circular spirals. So it's good if you have a square part or a rectangular part that you're trying to start from the center and work out. Ramp, we looked at. Project is basically for engraving. So it's for um, let's say I took a 2D sketch onto a curved surface. Project allows you to take that 2D sketch and engrave it onto the surface. It's yeah. It's just for engraving text onto surfaces, pretty much. It is also very finicky. Morph. Ugh. I've not had good luck with morph. It's a neat concept, but basically it's parallel, but it follows the surface, is a good way to think about it. If your geometry gets too far from linear, though, it gets really confused with what direction the passes should be. So these are great because it's basically a constant width line. But let's say I was making a bunch of really weird curves. It gets confused on what direction it should be going. It doesn't like it. And then flow. Flow is pretty much for machining fillets or chamfers. Um, it is meant for just following weird, following surfaces that are round apart. A lot of these are very similar and what it comes down to a lot of the time is try one, look at the simulation, is it doing what you want? If it's not doing what you want, maybe shift up your strategy a little bit and try something different because they each generate slightly differently. So what confuses one might work on another. It's kind of a trial and error type deal, but it just depends. So kind of going back to this, you guys are talking about ball nose. The other type of cutter that are great for finishing is corner radius. So they're a square end mill and somebody put a fillet on them. They're nice because we actually use them for really heavy roughing at MSU. That's our most common use for them is doing really heavy roughing because on a square end mill, how many of you guys have chipped the corner on a square end? It happens all the time because the square corners are really weak. They technically have like a one thou radius on them. They're not perfectly square. Look at them under a microscope, it'll confirm that. But they're nice for doing small corner radii because you can get, you don't want to be spinning a 30 thou ball end mill. It's not fun. Ask me how I know. I've been there. It sucks. Don't do it. But they're great for doing weird stuff like that. They're stronger than a square end. They tend to give you better MRR. So how many inches, cubic inches of material a minute can you remove? They increase that. But you only have that radius for doing the weird 3D surface. So they're great for roughing out for a 3D surface, but they have a limited area to do that. Ball nose are traditionally what people use. There's one issue with ball nose that you guys will see when you do this. So, you guys are familiar with the concept of surface feed per minute, right? You use your SFM to find your RPM, that whole thing. SFM's constant. SFM, at the very tip of a, helical, of a ball end mill, is zero. That tip is technically not spinning, if you think about it. That creates problems. <laughs> Why? Because if you are trying to use just the very tip of a ball nose, it's not going to cut. Pop. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, 
you always need to be just a touch off the surface. That's kind of a pain because when you have a really, really long tool, has anybody here ever used a gun drill? Anybody, anybody like firearms? Okay, never mind. If you use a really long tool, you want to use the very tip of it because if you put a, a rod is really strong axially. Think if I put a bunch of these dry erase markers together <laughs> and clip them, they are really weak this way but they're really strong when I push them this way. So, if I'm using a really long ball nose to get into something, I want to use as close to that tip at the bottom as possible, but I don't want to use the tip because it's not spinning. So it's kind of horrible. So, so it's inconvenient, but if you want to get an actual cut on a quarter inch end diameter end belt, that's sticking three and a half inches below the cutter because somebody designed a terrible carbon fiber mold. <sighs> Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> but then you need to do that. Andrew's the guy I work with with carbon fiber. He's not on brand. I don't even know if he. There isn't. I don't remember anybody named Andrew that you guys know because you his last season was 2017. But I digress. So those are the things to think about with ball nose versus corner rings. Don't use the very tip of a ball nose. It's not going to work well. Will it cut? Yes, but not well. Step over and step down. This is the hardest number to pick. Why? Because you don't tend to know exactly what step over you need. Technically there are ways to calculate it and if you have a profile tolerance you can calculate, okay I have my passes going here, I'm going to create a little cusp here between my passes, how big is that, how much does it deviate, can you do the math? Yes. You guys don't have a profile tolerance so you can't use that method. What it really comes down to is experience and trying out different things until you find what you like. In my case, I think I give some ballpark numbers later, but I tend to like 5 thou for really precise, intricate work, things like artwork. Um, if I'm trying to do a 3D projection of something. If I just need something to create a flat-ish surface, I like to start around 10 to 30 thou, work from there. But, yeah. This kind of walks you through that. Find 3D surfaces, such as radius, fillets, start at 10 thou, work your way up or down depending on what the simulation looks like. Take advantage of the simulation. That is your greatest asset in trying to do 3D machining, is look at what the final part's going to look like. For artwork, I have done as small as 1 thou steps. That takes an incredibly long time. But sometimes you're doing something for the National Cemetery and it needs to look really good. That's, I've done some engraving work for them and I did some 1,000 passes because I wanted it to look really good. Because it's sitting on the cemetery director's desk. And so everybody who ever goes into a meeting with him sees it. So it's worth the 10 hours it took to make. And sometimes you just gotta cut one and then you can always run a finer pass. So if you are like, okay, this is looking borderline. I'm gonna get this one running, see how it goes. Look at the physical part. If you're like, okay, it doesn't quite look like I want it to, do a finer step over pass or step down pass and just remake it. Don't take it out of a part. Don't take anything that you were 3D surfacing out of a machine until you are happy with where things are, because when you're in the five to 10 thou steps range, trying to relocate your part and get it to everything to look clean becomes challenging. If you're using the wiggler on the Tormach, I mean, you get within about plus or minus three thou with that. If your steps are one thou steps, it's not gonna work. 
So don't don't be the grad students that messed up my molds. <laughs> don't be a grad student. And I'm probably gonna go to grad school, so I can't I can't do that one. But again, I beat this one to death earlier. Use the right tool for the slope angle you're dealing with. Use the right tool path. Pick what you want. Zero degrees is flat, 90 degrees is a vertical wall. So if you're trying to do angles, keep that in mind. Rest machine, again, one of those things. Sorry, I used Fusion instead of the inventor. Where's the habit? But rest machine, again, helps you save time. Really nice, but it increases your compute time. So don't overuse it. Smoothing, this is doing exactly what I was saying on here. Basically, it fits lines or arcs within your tolerance, makes it nice, but also it lets you deviate from the tree surface. So, trade-offs. If you're servicing the wing of an airplane, probably aren't gonna have much smoothing tolerance. But if you're doing a fillet, who cares? Who's gonna notice one thou? And then avoid touch surfaces, you guys saw that. It really just lets you control where you're cutting. That's the, that's the purpose. Lets you avoid cutting the things that you've already done. So, what we're gonna do now, why you guys have computers out. We are going to have you guys program some parts. These are both real parts that I pulled. This one is a mold for carbon fiber. So that was done, that is one of the molds I designed, or I helped them make for testing out the strength of carbon fiber composites. So it's a real part that I actually took from the research lab that I was doing. And then this is that one that you guys have a physical copy of. It is for pocket NCs, so the tiny little five axis mills. They're actually based in Belgrade, which is five miles from Bozeman. So that is a part I developed for them so that way, it allows you to hold dovetail vices and self-centering vices and all this commercially available hardware onto those machines. So it has a lot of weird mounting holes and stuff because it's basically an adapter. But it's really nice because instead of just being limited to their work holding options, it lets you use any of the commercially available stuff. So they're practical parts, they're real parts, I'm not just throwing some random crap at you. But what I want you guys to do is let's start out on the sign. It's, I believe it's called small sign, sign small c or something. But start on that one. What type of tool path do people think is good for this part? What would you guys immediately use? And there is a file in there that has my cam and shows you what I've done. Did I give you the exact cam that I would do for it? Maybe, maybe not. I chose a parallel, what would you guys choose? Parallel? Why parallel? determines what type of tool path we should use. Angle. Angle that's that's your slope angle. Maximum slope angle on this is about 60 degrees. So, therefore, you're going to want to use something that's meant for shallower cuts, probably. That's how I came to choose uh, parallel. So, play around with some step over. Also, what I want you guys to look at is play around with a 3D adaptive to rough out the part. You're probably going to want to start out with a 3 8 or half inch end mill. And something that you want to think about, if you want good consistent surfaces, you want your roughing passes to leave you with something that is going to give you constant tool pressure. So if your roughing is too coarse, 
you're going to be trying to take a lot off on your finish passes. So start out with a 3D adaptive, get most of the geometry, then try to finish it. I'll be walking around. If you guys run into questions, just raise your hand. I'll come and take a peek. But I want you guys to take a stab at programming and, and to actually play with some of these tools. Yo, do you have stock that you want to see as like specific dimensions? You can start out. I honestly would just do a relative size box that's about the size of the part. If I was actually doing this part, I would do a relative size box to give me whatever, or a fixed size box to whatever stock I happen to have on hand. In this case, I bought plates or some solid bars specifically for it, which was whatever the closest inch spec was.